It's one of the things that anthropologists were realizing was that when we do our work, we usually do our work over long periods of time. This field work can take uh, a year to two years with potentially having this occur over many decades. So there is a particular gap that occurs between how anthropological knowledge was traditionally developed and the more pressing problems that called for immediate attention to uh, issues uh, and how to apply good solid anthropological research to that. And one of the tools that's been utilized uh, for anthropological work in public health as sort of an answer to this call overall has been rapid ethnographic assessment. This was developed uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s by Scrimshaw and Hurtado. And it was, again, here used to facilitate the rapid generation and flow of information into interventions. And particularly, we can see this uh, being really important with things like uh, outbreaks of uh, particular diseases, such as the uh, Ebola outbreak, um, and how anthropological knowledge can be harvested uh, essentially uh, very quickly, be generated very quickly, um, and look at local reactions to the Ebola outbreak, how individuals are thinking about protecting themselves from disease, uh, how those individuals are thinking about the federal government as a whole, which might be overseeing medical interventions. Uh, and so all of these questions become really important in looking at exactly what individuals who are most susceptible, most at risk, think about uh, both preventing uh, prevention strategies that are recommended by international agencies or, or local governments, as well as the flow of goods and services into those populations in order to deal with um, the said outbreak. And then how is that actually perceived and what actually happens at the clinic? Is the, are the clinics a place where people go to get better, to go to get treatment, uh, or uh, if, uh, is it a place where people go to die or be further exploited? Um, so these are real questions that anthropologists can address uh, and, and do so in, in rapid ethnographic assessment techniques. And a lot of this is uh, one of the, the key elements here is relying on um, the local agencies that have good rapport, that have a good connection with a local community in order to be able to go in there very quickly uh, and essentially pitch the program for research, um, conduct the research very quickly, uh, often with community partners, uh, and then be able to publish the results, put the results out there. And I think I'm not necessarily in an academic context, but looking at this and in, in how uh, it can be utilized in, in various uh, contexts overall. So um, finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about medical anthropology and bioethics. And historically, anthropology and anthropologists as a whole have been rather marginalized in the discussions of bioethics. The fields that bioethics typically relies on would be philosophy, law, and biomedicine. Now, this ends up drawing the critique of anthropologists uh, with our focus on cultural relativism, on the um, importance of culture as a whole for and cultural construction for creating meaningful worlds. Anthropologists are critical of bioethic dis bioethicist discussions uh, when cultural differences are marginalized or excluded from said discussions, or uh, they're not treated uh, or not taken seriously. Um, the focus here would be the universalist assumption that Western values would apply to all populations. That is, uh, as Westerners, uh, you would have a uh, training uh, or respect for the individual. The paramount importance of the individual, sometimes called hyper-individualism, uh, in the context of anthropology, but the idea of human rights even goes into these discussions as, as well um, as the medical care delivery, respecting respecting individual autonomy. That is the individual the individual as the decision maker uh, in and of themselves without any coercion at all. Uh, that individuals have free will as well as self determination. That they are the ones that have the exclusive right uh, to say what is going to be done. Um, to themselves, which would include their body as a whole. Now, this does not align well with other cultural models, 
uh, that will look at a collectivist approach or cultural models where you would have rigid social hierarchies that would need to be followed. The other uh, point of intersection here that anthropologists have historically had difficulty with has been with the institutional review boards. Uh, the institutional review boards come out of a, a number of human rights violations um, that occurred during the atrocities of World War II, including human subject testings, uh, as well as some of the work uh, that had been done in the United States with the Tuskegee experiments. Now, a lot of these were done in, in the so-called advancement of, of medical knowledge. Uh, and so now this notion of informed consent is very important for individuals and institutional review boards. Now, how does one give their informed consent? In a legal type of setting, we see an increasing call for individuals to sign consent forms. Now, you can see how this would be problematic if you were conducting research on at-risk populations uh, for HIV. Uh, AIDS, for example, and maybe other STDs. Um, so if you were if you were doing research with sex workers, um, if you were doing research with uh, intravenous drug users, um, maybe those individuals wouldn't necessarily want their information or their name associated with things that they were saying. Uh, the issue would be if you were required to collect consent forms with individual signatures with their names uh, and then uh, could that information, and then hold on to that in a secure location. But um, as we've seen recently with a case, uh, the, Bel the Belfast Boston University case, that information of researchers, um, they were conducting oral history work um, on the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, and essentially what ended up happening was individuals uh, were implicating themselves as well, as, well as others uh, in the processes of these interviews these oral history interviews, uh, and it, of course, turned out that, that the obligation of the researcher to protect the confidentiality, the anonymity of the comments that were being made did not trump the, uh, the state, uh, both the United States and, and Ireland, in making claims to that knowledge for law enforcement. So uh, anthropologists are wary of the uh, IRB uh, as a whole in, in confronting uh, particularly work in medical anthropology with vulnerable population. And again, so here we see the tension between the law, sort of the, um, the uh, new moral discourses that come out of the institutional review boards, or um, what uh, political and legal anthropology review in a series of all, uh, articles refers to as the new bureaucracy of virtue versus um, the American Anthropological Association's Code of Ethics. Um, so there's some really complicated issues here uh, in the context of medical anthropology and bioethics. So this lecture has uh, looked at medical anthropology and defining medical anthropology, looking at some of the various foci or issues of study, looking at the history of medical anthropology before it emerges as a unique discipline, um, to the early 1970s when the Society for Medical Anthropology, as well as a number of journals start coming, uh, becoming available and anthropologists start publishing in, uh, and this becomes the sort of formation of the professionalization of the discipline as a whole. We looked at some of the various theoretical approaches in medical anthropology and looked at medical anthropology in the context of other fields of study and how medical anthropology intersects with um, knowing about the human condition as well as designing interventions that are appropriate in the particular cultural settings.